The enviable or uh, dubious distinction of being a visual effects designer is that when you do a movie that's two years long, if you simply rely on technology that exists when you begin the film to execute the visuals in that movie, the movie will be obsolete long before you're, you're even halfway through production. So what you need to do is you have to go with the, all of the wildest concepts, simply figure out a way, the best way that you can, to bring that stuff to the screen and assume that you will find the technology to make it work. The difference between this movie, the second movie that we're working on, and the first movie is we went through this process of invention. We had to bring the superhero and this higher persona, we had to empower him. In other words, you had to feel as if you and the audience understood what it was like to be uh, an individual who could swing from the top of a building, land on the sidewalk and go over and punch out some guy who was lifting some poor old lady's uh, handbag. You know, on the first Spider-Man, when I first started doing it, the first time I had him uh, jump off the ground, you know, 30 feet in the air to a wall, the, my first reaction was, this will never work. You have to go into a different world. You have to change your mindset to work with it. But it's hard to get there in the beginning because you're so attached to the physical world and how believable this character can be. And I've always said that you, we have to make that character incredible, but not unbelievable. Knees have to bend more, arms have to flex more, muscles become larger. You move in a different way, the center of mass moves differently in order to make it believable that this guy jumped off this 100 foot tall building and landed on the ground and walked away. So if you present a character in a comic book sense that does something like that and you simply use uh, human capabilities, the example would be to have a stuntman jump off a 10 foot high platform onto a pad and then simply take the way he lands, much in the sense that they use motion capture, and apply that to our CGI character, you know right away. You smell something is wrong with it. None of us are familiar with superhero body language. You have to interpret. One of the challenges of being the producer on this show was you got a script, and you did a breakdown, and then you got a new script, and you did a new breakdown, and you know so on and so on. Um, a lot of... Uh, Plot development points changed, dialogue changed a lot, but the, the basic part of the story was always in the script that, the early script that I got. Certainly all the action sequences, you know, it's described in a script, but it's never played out the way that you can do it in pre-visualization, uh, in a storyboard, and that's where, where we come in. And uh, John and I get together and come up with different ideas and throw those at Sam, and that's what we do through the whole movie is just keep coming up with new ideas and new ideas and try to throw at him, you know, 10 different suggestions on how this action could take place to give him something to pick from. You know, we had a fixed resource. I know nobody thinks there's a fixed resource here, but it is a fixed resource. Uh, an example would be we might have had 800 storyboards for the train sequence, which had to become 150 storyboards. And each of the sequences always are boarded long and they're always winnowed down. So the picture started very big and started being compressed into its essential storytelling components. A lot of the decisions about when to do CG, when to do stunts, when to do the real actor were hashed out in storyboard meetings at the start of filming. There's obvious stuff where mostly where there's safety issues or there are inherent risks that they're not going to put actors through and particular the principles for sure. What the actor can't do a stuntman does and what a stuntman can't do the CG model does. You know there's some stuff that just can't be accomplished any other way. Spider-Man swinging through the city 20 or 30 stories up. There's not really another way to accomplish that. Hopefully one feathers into the other, blends into the other in, in ways where you don't, you aren't taken out of the picture in the sense that you still believe it's the same actor going through the motions. this film, we had a new villain, a very good villain, uh, I think a very challenging villain, and we also had to show our character in the flesh. In the first movie we had masks for both 
uh, Spider-Man and for the Green Goblin. So their faces or flesh was covered throughout most of the film. We never had to create a CG character with, with CG flesh. Because uh, we had to intercut a lot with either a, a stunt Doc Ock or the real Alpha Molina, our skin and flesh had to hold up to very, very close scrutiny. And it's something that's been very difficult in CG in the past, so we knew that was going to be our biggest challenge. The amount of light that's striking my face, it's being refracted by my skin, how much comes out the other side and why, uh, is an enormous number of calculations. And there's ways to do that, but it would take months, literally, to render or to represent a single frame of my face with these lights in a computer-generated situation using purely the physics of it. So we, as always in the movies, cheat. Speed. We investigated some technology that was done primarily by the Institute of Creative Technology, which is a branch of USC. And we collaborated with them and went and used their device called a light stage, which is set up to capture what happens to skin when it's hit by different light sources. So there's a light in 275 positions or whatever it is. You actually photograph the skin doing what it does naturally. And what you have is the ability to combine that light from over there and that light from down there and that light from up there and that light from up there to make a light source that comes at me from that side. So what you end up with is a natural looking uh, a sense of flesh. What you do is you texture that, you know, essentially project that onto a piece of geometry, which is my face. And I got that by being scanned. In order to get the proper facial expressions on them, uh, John worked with Tobey Maguire, I worked with Alfred Molina, and we essentially directed them in facial performances of different ranges of emotion with motion capture. We measured every inch of their body, we cyber scanned every inch of them from head to toe, we did a lot of motion capture on their movements, facial expressions, how they open and close their eyes, how they smile, how they frown. You know, pretty much all of the range of emotions that we can get. We had them read lines from the script so we could capture performance of how they might say different lines of dialogue. Those expressions then became blend shapes. The blend shapes, the combination of a smile and a, a raised eyebrow are brought together and texture mapped using the flesh that we did in the original photography laid onto this geometry. And then an artist has to go back in and touch up the place where the eyebrow was lifted too much or one of the cheeks got a little too broad. But you get essentially all of the nuance, all of the subtlety uh, by using components from the actor and you get the performance by allowing the animators to put together the expressions with the proper timing. So that every time you see them in a fight sequence, if you stop and you go through slowly, you'll see all these different facial expressions on the characters. And it adds to the believability of that character as opposed to some generic scream, generic frown, generic pain, whatever. Certainly the, the shot that probably has to be, you know, the proof in the pudding is the one at the end when they're in the pier and Doc Ock pulls this whole fusion machine down and this last time we see him, he's full screen and he's all CG intending it to look like a real actor. And he drifts away down into blackness ultimately. And I don't know that we've ever uh, scrutinized an image like that, CG, that close on the screen before. So this is a, a wireframe representation of our computer generated Doc Ock. And what it is, is in the computer, a definition of what all the surfaces of, of the character are. And it's created through a number of different layers. And as we're evaluating the shot, we'll look at it in this form because it's a, it's a good form for us to see what's working and what isn't working and where we have detail and where we need detail. And then we'll go to the stage where we look at it in a, a sort of diffuse view, which is a, a surface that has very simple shading and very simple lighting on it. 
and it lets us see details like where wrinkles are and where intersections are, where the cloth might go through his body and where it's, it's working. Once we we're satisfied that everything's working in that view, we'll go to a view that's called an ambient occlusion render, and that's what this render is, and it allows us to see lighting and where areas are that will have the light that's in the scene occluded and where it's blocked. And so it allows us to notice where shadowing will occur, and we actually use it in our final rendering and lighting of the character. It's something that's relatively new in computer graphics over the last two to three years. Here we have four different layers to our final composited shot of the actor. So what our artist John Manos has done when he's lit the shot is worked very much like a director of photography would on set where he's put in special lights from different locations to highlight areas of the face that he wants to bring up or bring down. So in the top left hand corner he's got uh, a light from the, the right that gives good definition to the face and nice shadowing on the on the left hand side of his, his nose and that's going to be one of the primary sources. On the upper right corner it's a very very flat base. It's used for where we need to bring in detail that's in the shadows so everything doesn't go completely clipped out black. The left hand bottom side is uh, another fill pass and it fills in the left side of the face while still giving some shadowing definition. And then the bottom right hand image is a rim light and that's a very important light just to give definition of the hair and more dramatic sense to the lighting. Here we have all the different layers that go into the final composited shot that give an atmosphere and a realism and help, help sell the fact that it's underwater. We've got uh, in the top left uh, a backlighting look that gives um, some atmosphere and some depth to the shot. On the top right we have a uh, murky underwater feel so it's uh, a cooler bluish kind of tone and it gives some of the depth feeling of the water. On the bottom left is a bubble layer. It's like the fusion ball that he's falling down into is superheating the water and creating these bubbles around it. That also gives a depth to the shot. And then the bottom right is a background layer that shows uh, some shadowing from the source, the energy ball source through the actual uh, geometry that he's falling down into. You can put all the layers together and it helps sell the feel that we're underwater with, with many different layers and levels of, of depth. And of course our actor in the end, uh, we get a very good look at his face and it's, it's the closest actually we see of his face in the whole movie without the glasses. One of the things that really challenged us was, again, the final battle. The pier sequence was the most fun for me because we got to put everything that we learned throughout the process of making this movie, and you got to see it all in this big, exciting climax. We had CG pier, we had live action pier, we had miniature pier, we had water elements, we had smoke elements. This is a shot and really the whole sequence which combines both miniature photography and CG work, so it, they're not, um, they're not uh, separate of each other, they're combined. And, and really one of the artists in digital effects now is, is understanding photographic means and uh, computer means and how to blend them together, and that's really the best way to get the, uh, the most uh, dramatic effects. Now what? This particular miniature shot is complex in that we have uh, a number of practical effects are working with the miniature photography as well. 
All these wires are connected to the objects inside the warehouse and when our ratchet goes, it'll pull everything in the warehouse and uh, to basically start the collapsing sequence. We also have multiple cameras on this. This is the kind of event because, as you're saying, it's, you only do once. You want to capture it in many different ways because uh, a wide shot has uh, a life, uh, a certain amount of life. And then when you close up, you can extend everything. You can make it look bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that's why we have five cameras on this whole shot. And we're going to shoot a beauty pass. After that, we do an overexposure yeah. pass of the same thing. And then we turn out all the lights and do our prominence pass. OK? Each shot consists of um, uh, what we call normal exposure. Then we have an overexposed pass, which can give you all the different highlights. We have various affected lights, these flashlight elements. This is the actual, whenever the fusion machine has any prominences that come off of it, this is how these prominences would affect the building around it. And it all gets put together. This is all done in quarter scale. It has a lot of aspects to it that uh, have taken a lot of time, and a lot of design, and a lot of uh, forethought in creating. And this is the kind of thing that you, you really get to do once. So you have to do, make your best estimate uh, in terms of how things will combine together and then go for it. had not planned on doing the amount of CG water and the type of CG water that ultimately went into the scene. What tends to make it really successful is um, a really clever blend of practical elements and CGI elements, and that's usually the way that it sells best. Well, we didn't have that benefit because while we were shooting it, we didn't have the understanding of the description of the water we were going to be doing, so we didn't shoot elements with the intention of the use that they would ultimately need to be, to be the way they'd need to be put into the shots. Creating our, our CG water was a pretty big deal for us because we hadn't planned from the start to do it. It's just when we got our miniature water that this, the scale wasn't working that well. One of our guys, Theo Vandernoot, came up with a whole system that allowed us to bring a lot more interaction with our fusion ball and more dynamics to the water to get what the director wanted. So what we have here is a, a grid on a surface that represents where the, the giant scale waves are and it allows um, at the very base level us to see what the dynamics of the water are and this is a more refined version and we can see when it sags down that re represents where the influence of our fusion ball is that's sinking into the water so we kind of came up with the concept that it's pushing away the water from some magnetic force and creating this giant divot in the water. And as we progress in the shot, we start refining it with more and more detail so we can get more intricate definition of the surface. What we have here, we've taken a slice of the surface and started to define what its contours are. These lines represent vectors that define how this, the shape of the surface is represented in the computer. And the arrows help, help us determine where the slope of, of the surface is and how it's going to be used to generate the flow on top of the surface. So when we go back to our shot view, we can see there's a lot of different things around that are going to influence what the final look of the surface is. We put in images that we have from the set of the background pier that this whole scene takes place in and they're mapped onto cards and these cards are later going to define what the surface bounces off of where the water uh, has to intersect and bounce and interact with and also lighting wise how it's going to light the water and how it's going to reflect into the water so based on this background our artists start to put in geometry that our our simulation of the water will interact with and what we have here is 
a different representation of the water that just shows us smaller, finer detail that define little wavelets on top of the giant scale water. And there's different types of, of that representation that we have here. There's some sharper lines that show waves such as might be generated by wind. And then the smaller scale detail is for just internal turbulence in the water. And here we're basically dividing up the surface of the water into some different components that are used in our CG water pipeline. We have to define areas that are going to be generating like fine mist off of off the water and we have to define areas that are going to be doing different types of spray and different uh, extra levels of detail because basically to generate realism in water we need to have layers on layers of real kind of detail. It's not just a simple single surface, it's comprised of many, many different layers of spray and what water takes on different forms from the smallest droplets to giant expanses of, of large scale waves. And all of these are trying to be incorporated into this model. So now, lighting wise, we start to layer in reflections and highlights and all the things that give your eye the range of detail from the darkest level of things that don't reflect a lot of light or get a lot of light source illuminating them to areas that are directly reflecting like the top highlights of what's lit up here into the surface. These green lines represent areas that might generate uh, spray. And then based on these forces, these forces generate a, like a virtual wind or a virtual force in the direction of the arrows that starts to generate spray along these green sources. And you can see through the rippling here, the water-like forces that are propagating through the water. This is just a graphical representation of all the forces that are being calculated in the water system. The other thing that makes this system much more complex is we have to have the water surface interacting with everything that falls into it, which in computer graphics is usually pretty difficult. So what we've done is to put that geometry down into and intersect into our, our water and then we do additional calculations based on that. And then even on top of that we at the end of the day layer in real water and real spray elements that we've captured on set. The train sequence was probably the most daunting because it was the most fleshed out in the script and it was easy to see and to be able to read between the lines early on that it, there was going to be a lot of CGI work involved. I think we worked on the train sequence uh, certainly from day one, um, you know, till the very, very end of the film. So across that whole two years we worked on the train sequence. It became clear early on in the design of the train sequence we were going to need a lot more than just plates from New York with trains at it. Uh, we decided the quantity of work dictated that we should probably shoot some real trains somewhere. Research brought us to the Loop in Chicago, which has contemporary high-rise buildings, which has an elevated train, and it's not altogether that different than the kinds of cars that would have or could have run on tracks for an elevated train in uh, Manhattan. We got on board really early just trying to plan the logistics of that and trying to determine how one might take Chicago footage, blend it with New York footage, blend it with CGI buildings and atmosphere and street elements and that sort of thing to put together a scene that played as if it was shot in New York. We put 16 cameras on a railroad car and we had, that was our train, we drove it around the loop, there were other trains on the loop, we had our own conductor and everything, and we drove this, this, uh, this elevated train bristling cameras around and around and around. Those plates became backgrounds uh, for running shots, where there's 
images outside the windows, images across the top of the car where the camera has limited motion. We did a spider cam shot using a real Chicago train, a real stretch of Chicago street, where the camera starts out close on the characters and pulls back to reveal the train pulling away. We shot vistas or arrays, meaning we do tiles. We'd shoot a 180 degree field of view with, uh, with action people and cars and all of that and then we could seam those things together and make camera moves after the fact. Here's an example of a pan and tile Chicago plate. Here's the pan and tile all put together and that consists of three different cameras, three different 65 millimeter cameras that were shot off of the L in Chicago. Camera one, camera two, camera three. Stitch that all together Add in your uh, CG elements, and there you go. This has CG Train, CG Spidey, CG Doc Ock, live action background integrated with CG background. In the far distance is all CG background. In the foreground, it's a live action building element. Sometimes it's a completely CG shot. But wherever you can, you use a real train, you know, that was set on rockers and, and uh, uh, different things that the mechanical effects guys would uh, put together to, to make the train shake like a real train. There's lots of stuff in the, in the train sequence where there's combinations of CGI characters with live action train. In some cases there's live action character shot blue screen on top of CGI train with a live background or a CGI background. So it's like a giant mix and match. Certainly when they're fighting on the side of the train, uh, that was difficult in the sense of trying to have laws of physics of gravity apply to them. Even if their feet can stick, they're going to be affected by gravity. And, and this shot definitely involved a lot of trying to get the exact right feel of how gravity would affect that. The right strength and look in the tentacles and everything else is uh, it's a big job. A big job. It was one of the more difficult sequences. At the start of the train sequence, we sent a team of people to Chicago to get a bunch of plates that were used as backgrounds for a lot of the sequence, but many shots didn't have those backgrounds. So what we had to do was make our own. For both the buildings and the train, we sent a team to go acquire the geometry through laser surveying and take dozens and dozens of photos of the actual real buildings and the real train to apply as texture maps. We used the Chicago footage as reference for the lighting and look of our buildings, but all of this is virtual and created in the computer to allow us the ability to move the camera around wherever we wanted. So what we have here is a wireframe representation in the computer of what this corridor of buildings might be. And this is what that corridor of buildings looks like when we apply our lighting and textures to it. In this shot, we couldn't use the footage in Chicago, so we had to create something in the computer that matched it. And then once you know that all the geometry integrity is good, then the lighters would actually really place lights in the scene and bring the whole scene together. We paid a lot of attention to reflections in the windows of the characters and the environment and reflections in Spider-Man's eyepiece. When we're working, we plan to do CG versions of the environments and CG versions of the characters, so some of it we know ahead of time while we're shooting that there's no way to get it and we'll have to do it virtually later, but sometimes It'll just come up later, and because we're prepared to do it, we just work with surrounding real shots and marry our, our virtual footage and sandwich it in between the real shots. Typically, the type of shots we're doing, just because of the camera move or uh, different factors, needs to be completely computer generated. Even our virtual actors, though, are created very, very much from the real actors in terms of all the nuances. We definitely still really need the actors. It's just we can get away with using them in a different form later.
I think what the new, the new CG methodology and the limits of CG today, what they allow the director and specifically they allowed Sam to do because he likes to work this way, is to really sculpt and craft his movie after all the principal photography is done in so-called post. We have a system set up here that we set up on the first Spider-Man. It was the first time it was set up and we've uh, pretty much perfected it for Spider-Man 2. It's a, a fiber channel, real-time connection between the visual effects department and production editorial, which is over a mile away. So the f we can share media, ideas, real time. Basically gives Kevin the ability to work here on his Avid live. He can cut sequences in live, he can update material. Um, when the editor has finished a scene or recut something, he basically has spontaneous access to it. I mean, he can, he can pull something up and, and see it. Because the project is so fluid and it changes constantly, we have to have a very quick way of getting iterations of effects and ideas back and forth. We can very quickly make those changes, send it over to editorial, real time. They can see it and give us comments back. It just makes the process flow a lot smoother. Uh, it used to be visual effects people were primarily um, engineers. They'd come in and say, technologically you can achieve this or you can't achieve that. With the advent of computer imaging and the ability to do virtually anything, because you can build images a pixel at a time, uh, the onus of being the engineer was taken away. With each film and with each experience, you, you get to be a little more educated like in anything. So hopefully, you know, the third one's gonna be, uh, have things that are uh, unique and more special than the second one, you know? Anything to try to just outdo what we did. But. Sam really likes things freeform and he likes to make choices on things based on all the information around him and a lot of information shows up sometimes the day of. And so what I've learned from working with him both, both on the first movie and on this movie is you've got to be able to respond to everything. What you really have to do is pick out those moments um, where you can craft something by standing with one foot in technology and one foot in the creative storytelling side of things. It's given me an opportunity to become more involved in the storytelling, the filmmaking aspect of making movies. What I learned was that's where I want to focus on creating those moments. Yeah.